third odyssey needs to be stopped or does it let's take a look hi everyone and welcome to today's video where we're going to be checking out the third odyssey mod for eu4 if you enjoy this video don't hesitate to leave a like and subscribe since only 30 percent of you are subscribed and you can become a member today so third odyssey is an alternate history mod where we play as byzantium or the roman empire or basilea Romayon, whatever you want to call them. And basically we're going to embark on a grand odyssey into the new world and then maybe try and take back the motherland. What does this all mean though, since that's not a very uh, descriptive description? Well, let's jump into the game as Byzantium right here and I'll show you exactly what this mod is about. And by the way, it is one of my favorite mods for EU4 and definitely one of the best concepts for a mod for EU4 in my opinion. Of course here in the start screen we have the third odyssey and the land of wine and honey. Now I'll do this start first and then we'll jump into the land of wine and honey where you can experience something completely different to this start. But basically the only nation you want to play in this mod is Byzantium. So let's pick them right there and jump in. And here we are as Byzantium and we're greeted with the third odyssey welcome screen where you can read this for yourself and see what it's all about. But basically, it outlines a little bit of history for Byzantium, but also the state of mind that the current ruler, Ioannis Palaiologos here, is in. And basically, this kicks off our campaign, where we get the Roman flight disaster until the end of the game, which gives us the following effects. Plus 6 national rest, minus 50 morale of armies, minus 100 fort maintenance, minus 50 fort defense, plus 300% hostile core creation on us, and minus 3 diplomatic relations. Also, Ioannis here, loses all of his stats so he goes from a 433 to a 000 and we lose Athens as our subject. Now don't worry this isn't all that bad and soon you will see why. So let's just click this and there we go books of fire. This is a nice little event that you can read for yourself and you definitely should read it but here we get an artist, a skill 2 minus stab cost that's 75% cheaper and a military engineer, a skill 2 fort defense guy who's also 75% cheaper. And there we go we have basically started our campaign. Now, how do you get to the new world from here? Do you have to explore? Do you have to pick exploration ideas? Do you have to exile yourself to Ireland first and then go colonial? Well, no. Let's on pause and you can see all the events that will follow before we move to the new world. And there we go, the Silk of the Empire. Added to the list, we get a new heir. And basically we get a 543 heir with a strong claim which replaces Constantinos who is a 635. And let's continue. And now we get another event, the fate of the Morian dispute where basically some Italian nations want us to get rid of Moria right here. So we can sell it to the Venetians and we get a light ship and development upon landing and we release Moria of course. Then we can sell it to the Genoese where we gain troops and arms in quotation marks increases our manpower and troop count upon landing. So we get an army buff if we sell it to the Genoese, we get a navy buff if we sell it to the Venetians, and we get stab, ducats, and stuff like that if we just grant them independence. So in my case, I actually want some troops and I'm gonna sell it to the Genoese. And there we go, Morea is a subject of Genoa. Let's continue. And here's another event, the Venetian captains. We'll have to consider their plan, at least we gain another Diplo Rep advisor that's 75% cheaper. We're not gonna get them yet, we will get them soon though. Let's continue, and here's the final checklist, basically the final preparations Ioannis here is making before departing for the new world. This is our status supply, how much we can carry, and this is the status of the fleet. So, we get a siege naval weapon that hasn't been seen in centuries, and these are the modifiers that we get. Basically, Greek fire until the end of the game, where we get some awesome, awesome navy bonuses. This is something else we can take, books and scrolls, where we get tech and idea cost on until the end of the game with minus 10%, pretty sweet. We can also bring silk for trade efficiency and we can hire Venetian captains where we get an advisor and some other navy stuff and we can set sail. So for example, I want this tech and idea cost. I'm gonna take that. We still have a high supply status. We can take something else, I guess, and I'm gonna take this naval stuff. So now it's sufficient. Status of the fleet, Greek fire armament. We can also bring something else, but then their status is scarce. And if we take everything, they're abysmal and uh, we may not make it to the new world. So let's just take two things 
and we're ready to set sail. Now I know this might be a bit confusing, but stay with me here. Let's continue and unpause. And here we got another event, Rebels and Exiles. So we can get Skenderbeg, who we all know is a 555 general, and uh, some of his troops, and Orhan, with nothing left to lose, will take control of Constantinople and make a bid for the Turkish throne. Now that guy is basically a guy from Rum, right? Everyone knows Rum, another nation which is similar in power to the Ottomans when you reform them. Or we can take that guy and he becomes a skilled to discipline advisor who's 75% cheaper and basically Albania declares war on the Ottomans. So let's take Skanderbeg, I do want a 555. And let's unpause again. And there we go. Now we've basically set sail since we do have Granada and pirates and uh, we're somewhere over here in the Mediterranean. So we can pay for safe passage, no need to fight and lose 80 ducats, we can't afford that. Or we can set them alight with Greek fire. This will partially deplete our cash of Greek fire, but hey, it won't be any use of us if we're dead. I'm thinking let's not get involved with these Granatum pirates and let's just pay them. And let's continue, we're still setting sail in the Mediterranean. And another event, the Portuguese wish to strike a deal. So we can gain a ship and supplies in the form of a light ship and base production upon landing and 30 ducats, Portugal gets the event, the last sighting of the Byzantines. Or we get the same bonuses, but Portugal gets a different event. So this isn't that important for us, but it's important for Portugal and what they will do for the rest of the game. Uh, let's get this one. Now we're still sailing, we're somewhere over here I'm guessing, and a couple of days are going by, another event, a storm approaches. So we're sailing for a few weeks, so we're probably somewhere in the Atlantic by now. Now we have encountered a storm, so it took the royal ship and Ioannis loses even more stats, or it took one of the supply ships. Let's uh, lose one of the supply ships, I don't think we want to lose the royal ship. Or maybe we do, if we lose the royal ship, Ioannis right here, he might go away and we might get this guy. So uh, let's actually lose the royal ship. And there we go, Ioannis actually does die and we get a new ruler and Constantinos here gets on the throne and Theophilus becomes an heir. We also gain a stab. And there we go. That's actually something we do want to pick since we do want to get rid of the 0, 0, 0 ruler. Even though this was his idea to go over here, sometimes, you know, you gotta crack a few eggs. Let's continue and we have another event, the Pantheon Worship. Now this is a very important event because we get to pick our religion. You make a compelling argument. Hellenic becomes the new state religion of Byzantium. This will also apply to our rulers and an heirs, or haha, that's a good one, let's stay orthodox. I do recommend going Hellenic just for the flavor and everything that it brings along. And there we go, now we're Hellenic. So while we're over here, let's check out what the Hellenic faith has to offer. Tolerance of heretics plus two, missionary strength versus heretics plus one, pretty nice. And local missionary strength plus one. We can select deities as Hellenic. And these are the deities it offers. Zeus, missionary strength and religious unity, Hera, legitimacy and chance of new air, Poseidon, morale of navies and global settler increase, Hades, stab cost and yearly inflation reduction, Ares, morale of armies and AE impact, Athena, yearly army tradition decay and tech cost, Hermes, trade efficiency and trade steering, and Aphrodite, diplomatic reputation and relations. Since we are going over to the new world, I would think global settler increase and morale of navies would help us out, so I'm gonna go with Poseidon. You can pick whichever one you want. And let's continue our journey over to the new world. And there we go, we have arrived. Forgotten homelands. We are no longer aware of what goes on in our ancient homelands. Now oblivious to the old world, we can focus on the new world ahead of us. Will we ever return? Our old homelands are no longer mapped. As we can see, we can't see the old world, which should be right here. And the Empire of Elysia. Basically, we become a new nation. We're no longer the Roman Empire or Byzantium, whatever you want to call it. And uh, what's done is done. We get a flagship, some nice bonuses and stuff like that. And yeah, we got Skanderbeg because we chose him in that event earlier. And here we are. This is us. This is everything we can see. We have landed and established our new nation of Elysia. We do have a unique government type, which I will get into soon. And we have our ruler and heir. But yeah, now what do we do that we are in the new world? Well, we're assuming that we're in the new world, right? We also have a nice little flagship here. Pretty nice, but it is damaged since we did take it over here. We also have some decisions to take. Let's encourage divination. Why not? And let's unpause and check out some new events that we'll get. Eager Explorers, great. We get Colonial Range minus 100, but plus one colonists. So we can basically explore everything that's next to us. And there we go, we discover some provinces like these two over here. They do have different names, Nia Constantinopolis or Elysia. And the entire state is named Elysia as well. We can also choose a native policy, let's choose native coexistence. And we can pick a deity once again. We already picked Poseidon, so I'm gonna go with him again. And we have an alliance offer from Pequot. 
Let's not accept that just yet, since they can probably see us even though we can't see them. And we have also discovered this nation, which is right next to us as well. Here's two more events local natives appreciate our pantheon. This is good, some improved relations. And here we can choose what to do with our ship, so gain tax and production, gain a fort and 15 mil, gain 500 sailors, 80 ducats and some trade bonuses or keep the ship, get some more ships, and we get a new flagship as well. I do think this is the most flavorful one, so I will go with that. There we go. And our ship has been repaired. At this point, we can also hire those advisors that we got from the events. Skill 2 guys are cheaper than skill 1 guys. Well, not for Diplo because we didn't get that guy, but at least for admin and mill. So now that we're in the new world and we can continue our campaign, first thing you're probably gonna wanna do is send a colonist to one of these two lands right here. So let's send our guy over there. And let's check out what Elysia actually is by going into the government tabs. We can see that we're Greek culture, Hellenic faith. And if we go into the government reforms, we can see that we're an exiled empire. We get plus 20 stab cost and usual legitimacy plus one, as well as plus one number of states. Now, number of states, I'll explain that soon. But there are also some other tier one reforms, such as Elysian autocracy and senatorial empire, which you can get into. These other ones will be familiar to. Going into the missions, we do have a very, very extensive mission tree. Now, we do have some generic missions over here and over here, but we do have unique missions which focus on growth over here in the new world at least for some time where we basically focus on building up our nation conquering the nations all around us colonizing even more getting new trade goods Elysian silk we reproduced in Elysia what what is that yeah, but then we can get to here back to the motherland where we actually need to go back and obviously uh reconquer Constantinople and there we have two more missions right here now you can see some color coded missions down here and basically later down the line you will be focusing on only only one of these three. So if you get Heir of Justinian, which will focus on restoring your old world borders, as we can see here, Rome restored. So this red branch focuses on re-establishing the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, whatever you want to call it. And basically you will focus on reconquering the old world. But if you pick this one, you can't pick this one or this one. So only green, only red, or only blue. That's what you're going to be picking. The green branch, however, focuses on colonizing and establishing dominance of the new world, basically North America and South America. America. Like I said, if you get this one, you can't go down this one or down this one. Of course, you can do that by yourself, but the missions won't guide you towards it. And the blue one also focuses on colonization, but in the old world. So you're going to be colonizing Africa, India, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and provinces, areas, and regions like that. By the way, we do have unique units. So as we can see right here, Roman levy infantry, Eastern Roman cavalry, all of these are unique ones, all the way up to tech 30, as we can see. And you will have a lot of fun going through those. Now going into the ideas, you may be wondering what idea groups we're gonna pick. Now this is something unique about this mod, these can change depending on the types of missions you complete. So these national ideas right here aren't permanent, but you can check them out for yourself. We automatically discover adjacent provinces, native assimilation and uprising chance, basically focusing on colonizing mostly during this early game. Now when you go to pick an idea group, you're gonna be encountered with, well, development ideas. That's the only one you can pick. Basically, the game forces you to open up through these and that's a very strong idea group. Basically, once we get the first one, we unlock new idea groups and removes the a new world to explore modifier, which gives us some bad modifiers. We get a colonist, stuff like that. Construction and dev cost, focusing on colonizing once again. So let's get some admin points so we can see how it is to unlock other idea groups. There we go, I've teched up to tech five. Now I can tech dev ideas. And once we unlock the first idea, we get another colonist and we can take other ideas, which are the regular ones. Now development ideas does replace exploration ideas, but you can get exploration back by completing some missions or decisions. And uh, if you've ever wondered how slow or fast colonizing will go, where well, here we can see 560 settlers a year. Basically, it's only gonna take you two years to colonize a province and once you go down even further it increases even more 580 a year and here we get another event militia matters where we can gain some dev in our capital city but it also enables a new estate what's all that about let's see and here we have the dinatoya estate which is basically the nobles now i know this is the old estate system and i will explain that later but yeah this is what the estate looks like by the way we do go over here with feudalism and we are of course much more advanced than the native nations of course i am tech 5 
because I teched up to show you the ideas, but we would be tech 3 and these guys would be tech 1. Now let's take a look at the rest of the new world and how everything is. Of course, this is expected. We have some natives right here, some you would know and some you wouldn't know as well. These are the trade nodes. So we have the Bay of Elysia, Andronica, Toba Adi, Tholea and Hesperidia, Thorf and Bay. What's all that about? Ericsson Gulf and of course, Ohio. <laughs> These are the regions, North Elysian Coast, South Elysian Coast, so some stuff has been renamed, lots of provinces are renamed as well. But if we go up here, we can notice some other nations that aren't supposed to be here. Markland, a Jarldom with Jarl Eric Eriksson, and Heluland with Jarl Egil Karselfni. What's all that about? Well, we have Viking nations in the north of North America. They are tech too, so they are a little more advanced than the natives, but this is something else you might encounter in in the new world. Of course, we don't know about them when we get over here and they don't know about us. So how that dynamic will play out is up to you. Over here, we have another Hellenic state, Mikra Crete, and you could discover them soon or late, depending on choices you took in events during your voyage to the new world. And they can even become your subject. And by the way, we do have unique subject types in this mod. As we can see the Vikings up here, the two Viking nations are also allied to each other. So uh, yeah, they might pose a problem later on. We'll see though, we'll see. And that's just some of the things that this mod has to offer when playing as the nation of Byzantium into Elysia, then re-establishing Byzantium, re-establishing the Roman Empire, the choices are yours. Elysia is basically a new world nation originating from the Byzantine Empire. You already saw the event chain surrounding the trip to the new world, and it does influence how you play the game depending on the decisions you take. There's new religions, basically the Hellenic faith. There's a, also a syncretic pagan faith for Mesoamerica. The Vikings exist. Another power of old world origins now basically our rival in the new world and there will be also some successor states in uh, Mesoamerica such as Spartacon but I'll let you explore that for yourself there's various new minor nations whose faith is influenced through our choices and decisions we can return to Europe and reconquer the ancestral lands which is guided by a very very extensive event chain there's unique estates idea groups events decisions and more and I'll let you figure out the rest of it for yourself as the nation of Elysia. Now let's jump back to the star screen and jump into the Vikings to see what they have to offer as well. And here we are back in the star screen. Let's select single player and let's pick the land of wine and honey start date. So we have uh, six nations to pick from, which would be the most interesting ones. You could start as Portugal or Castile, see what they get up to in the new world by the time you arrive. And they might have a lot because as we all saw, they do colonize very quickly. Either way, let's jump into the Vikings. We can pick Hello Land, which is this nation, Markland, which is this nation. We can even choose Cahokia, which is this nation right here, a native nation and some other native ones. And definitely read this for yourself. It is a very interesting text, but let's jump in as um, Markland, for example. Sure. And here we are as the Jarldom of Markland, one of two Norse colonies in Vinland, established by the legendary Viking explorer Leif Erikson almost five centuries ago. And here we get another pop-up screen as previously. Let's get started. Add discovery idea group, strangers in a strange land idea, and uh, some negative modifiers but also some positive ones. And there we go, we have an idea group basically before anyone else in the world with one idea unlocked. We are tech 2, so we're stronger than the natives, but we will be weaker than Elysia by the time they arrive. We also don't have feudalism. As you know, we are Norse. If you haven't played a Norse nation before, these are the modifiers. Norse does exist in base game EU4, by the way, where we have Odin, Freya, Thor, Thir, Njord, Snotra, Uller, and Hell. None of these guys help us for colonizing, so I am gonna go with Njord for now. We also have a mission we can unlock, a default one, but we do have a couple of unique missions. We need to colonize Greenland, conquer Iceland, conquer Ireland, Scotland, retake our homeland, and conquer England. Going into the decisions, we can form the nation of Vinland because, well, like that pop-up text read, Vinland was established, but now there are these two nations right here. So basically, uh, we need to conquer the other one for us to become Vinland. And we can even reform the Norse faith. Our government type is a Jarldom. We get minus 10% naval maintenance, minus one diplo relations, minus 10% unjustified demands, and plus one number of states. The other reforms you would already know from regular EU4. And of course, we immediately get an alliance once we start playing from the other Viking nations, which of course, we're not gonna accept because we do want to conquer them. Hey, 
There can only be one, what can I say? Once some time has passed, we will discover the Erikson River, according to us, which by the way is a navigable river, so you can take your ships down here. And once some more time passes, we will have also discovered the Great Lakes, unbelievable. And yeah, we can take ships down here. As we can see, the colonized provinces will not colonize. The provinces where natives already exist, they do have ports. This is an inland sea, galleys will be more effective here, so you definitely want to get involved with the Great Lakes as soon as possible. Now that a couple of years have passed, let's reveal the map and see if Elysia has well, if it has been established. And we can see that they actually have arrived and they already have two provinces right here. They got Constantinos and Theophilus. They have allied Lenape. And uh, yeah, of course, we won't be discovering them that soon, but uh, we know that they exist over here. And here's the other Greek nation as well, Mikra Crete. Basically, uh, this nation is sort of established by that one, the lost ship, I think. So I think that's how that works. Not sure though, you can explore that for yourself. And that's basically what you will be doing as the Viking nations up here going and colonizing Greenland, once again going back to the New World, retaking Scandinavia, making it Norse, making it Viking, conquering North America, getting into conflict with Elysia, maybe you will be allied to them, maybe not though, maybe you're gonna have to fight them. They are stronger than us at this point, and they probably will be by the time you encounter them. And that's pretty much the setup for the third Odyssey Back to the Motherland mod for EU4. Three very interesting nations to play, Byzantium into Elysia, Markland, or Heluland, you can then form Vinland, go back and reconquer the old world. As Elysia, you can also do that, grow massive over here, go back, reconquer the old world, forget about the old world, colonize the entire new world and establish an empire here, get into conflict with the colonizers, do colonizing yourself in the old world, a little reverse Uno card right there, and the possibility abilities are basically endless in this mod, which features one of the most unique concepts that I think has been done for a mod for EU4 and something you definitely have to check out for yourself. Going back to the New World, we can see that, well, Haram has replaced Byzantium. This is that Orhan guy, basically, because we chose to get Skanderbeg with us. This is what happens in Byzantium. If we took this guy with us, well, Albania would have probably taken it or something like that. I don't know. I haven't picked Orhan yet. Now, if you're wondering why the map looks like this, this is because I'm playing on 1.29.6. This mod hasn't been updated for 131 or 130 yet, but I can assure you the developers are working on a 131 update. It just been slowed down due to how the natives interact with the world in the Leviathan update, but it will be coming soon with some very, very nice features along with it. So if you want to play this mod, you need to revert back to 1.29.6, but honestly, it's not a problem at all and you should definitely go for it. It takes like two seconds to roll back and you will have a ton of fun playing this mod. Just roll back to 131 when you're done if you want to. And in a nutshell, that's third Odyssey back to the motherland. A huge shout out to all the devs that have worked on this mod. Like I said, I really, really love the concept and it's obviously taken a lot of time and effort to get to here. And I'm sure that the update for 131 will be excellent as well. And we can have some fun with it in the latest version of U4. But like I said, definitely rule back to 129.6 and play this mod for yourself. Let me know in the comments below what's the next mod that I should showcase. I'm kind of running out of good mods to review. So I think uh, these mod reviews will get even more rare in the future and I'll only do them once in a while. But if you guys enjoy them, I might do one if a great mod pops up that I need to cover. And as always, the link for this mod will be in the description. If you enjoyed this video, don't hesitate to leave a like and subscribe since only 30% of you are subscribed and you can become a member today. And join the Discord. The link is in the description. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time with another EU4 video.